today on Grace to You. Since we are His loved children, we have the capacity now to imitate God. If you want the greatest expression of love, you only need to listen to the words of Jesus. If you're going to be an imitator of God, then you need to be characterized by that which is most definitive of God, and that is His love that forgives. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We come now to the Word of God, the Scripture, and I ask you to open your Bible to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. We are working our way through Ephesians and find ourselves at chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. And this becomes for us a high point. That's hard to say with regard to Ephesians because everything seems like a high point. But this is indeed a high point. This uh, wonderful passage begins in the clouds, it begins in the lofty heavenly stratosphere of being imitators of God, and it ends down on earth with the sinful lists that are provided for us which we are to avoid that lead finally, as verse 6 says, to the wrath of God. And again, we are reminded that we are to have no part with that. And that is a theme all through the book of Ephesians. We saw that, didn't we, back in chapter 4 and verse 22. If you are a believer in Christ, you had a former life, but you laid aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. You were renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth." This is the very main thrust of this wonderful epistle. And I've been pointing you back to chapter 2, verse 10. We are, as those who have been saved, the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We've been learning from the book of Ephesians that salvation is a total transformation. It is complete change. It is going 180 degrees in the opposite direction. It is ceasing to be under the authority and power of Satan, as it tells us in the beginning of chapter 2, walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. It ceases to be that, and instead of walking in the power of Satan, chapter 3 ends with verse 19 saying, we now can be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's how dramatic the transformation is. And again, this seems to be a question asked so many, many times, how do I know I am a true Christian? And we've learned the answers very clearly through the book of Ephesians, and we'll see it again this morning. Now we are called to something in verse 1 of chapter 5 that may on its surface seem like too high a standard. Notice verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Since we are His loved children, since He loved us enough to make us His children, And since, as a result of that, we have become partakers of the divine nature, that's what Peter says, we have become partakers of the divine nature, we have the capacity now to imitate God, and in one particular way, walking in love. So with this opening of chapter 5, we come to the main issue in your life as a Christian, love, love. And love that is basically defined by its eagerness 
and its willingness to forgive. If you want the greatest expression of love, you only need to listen to the words of Jesus. It's not sentiment, it's sacrifice. Listen to John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The greatest act of love possible is complete self-sacrifice, even giving your life, if necessary, in death for someone else. Now, none of us have done that, or your funeral would already have taken place, but you're here. This is an extreme kind of love that reaches out to someone who is not perfect, someone who is not deserving, and says, I will give my life for you. I will die that you might live. That is essentially what Christ did. Romans tells us in chapter 5 that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the call to that kind of love, the love that forgives, as verse 32 says, as God in Christ has forgiven you. 1 John 2.12 puts it this way, your sins have been forgiven, and then it says, for His name's sake. It really, in the, in the primary sense, isn't for you, although you're a beneficiary of it. It's for the fame of God. It's for the glory of God. He forgives sin to put His grace on display, to put His mercy on display, to put His compassion on display, to put His love on display, and to put it on display everlastingly throughout all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. We will, along with the redeemed of all the ages and the holy angels, praise God endlessly and eternally for His forgiveness, for His forgiveness. The point is simple. You can't love like God unless you are marked by forgiveness. Unless, if you want to be like God, you act toward people who offend you the way God acts toward people who offended Him. Jesus said in Luke 6 that you need to show mercy as your Father in heaven showed mercy. This is the characteristic of God that Paul is driving at. This kind of love is so extensive. Go to the end of chapter 3, at least down to verse 17, that trying to get a grip on it is hard. But Paul prays for the believers to be rooted and grounded in love. This is the foundation of everything in your Christian life. To be rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints, this should be the universal understanding of all true believers, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Amazing statement. Paul prays that believers would understand the entire range of divine love, which is beyond comprehension. How can we know something that's incomprehensible to know? Well, we can to the degree that the Spirit of God instructs us. But here's the remarkable thing about verse 19. When you come to understand that love, that love that surpasses knowledge, you can be filled up to all the fullness of God. So if you're going to be an imitator of God, then you need to be characterized by that which is most definitive of God, and that is His love that forgives. And if you have that same love and understand it in its fullness, you can be filled up to all the fullness of God. You want to be like God? You want to be as God is? You want to be as a beloved child who can bear the name of the Lord and demonstrate that you belong to that Lord and that you manifest part of His essential nature? Then you have to love the way He loved. And if you love the way He loved, you are experiencing the fullness of God. Those are just 
beyond comprehension kinds of promises and realities. I mean, here we are groveling in the humanity of our fallenness, and we're just grateful to sort of crawl out of the muck and have the Lord save us and forgive us and bring us to Himself. And He's not satisfied with that at all. He wants us to come all the way to the place where we literally become imitators of God, and in particular, we love the way He loves. In 1 Peter 4, 8, the Apostle Peter was speaking of this very reality, and he says, above all, this is again, this is the priority in the Christian life, keep fervent in your love for one another. Fervent ectenes. It's used of a muscle that is completely stretched to its maximum limit. Reach as far as you possibly can to love one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So th this love we're talking about is the kind of love that covers sin. It's the kind of love that forgives. And by the way, Peter is borrowing language from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, which says, love covers all transgressions. This is pretty practical because we're all going to be offended, right? We're, we're all going to be treated unkindly, unfairly. We may be slandered. We may be abused. So what should be our response? Vengeance, retaliation, anger, hostility? No. No. Those things were laid out for us as things to be avoided back in chapter 4, verse 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. Put it all away and give back kindness and tenderheartedness and forgiveness the same way God in Christ forgave you. If you're in Christ, God doesn't hold your sin against you. He completely forgives it. This is so evidently missing. In our world, this, this has got to be the most angry, hostile, hating, vicious, destructive culture perhaps since uh, days of paganism before Christ even arrived on earth. Everybody wants to destroy everybody else. And it finds its way into the church, the professing church, which then becomes self-destructive. And our Lord gives us a completely different direction. I want you to love each other the way I love you. And how do I love you? I forgive you all your trespasses constantly, every day. Peter said, how many times shall I forgive? Seven. The Lord said, 70 times seven, endlessly, nonstop. Forgiveness is what defines our love. God's beloved children are to be like Him, imitating Him. And what does that mean? Imitating Him in forgiveness, self-sacrifice. This is the issue here. If you want to imitate God, then you have to be forgiving. Whatever the offense, whatever the slander, whatever the maligning attack on you, whatever inequity and unfairness, whatever abuse may have come your way, whatever it is. You leave the results to God. Vengeance is His. He will repay. He takes care of all those accounts, and you offer what He gave you, and that is complete forgiveness. He loved us, and because He loved us, He forgave us, and that forgiveness is eternal, and to seal that forgiveness, He placed in us the Holy Spirit, the seal of promise, chapter 1 says. The Spirit took up residence in us. The Son took up residence in us. The Father takes up residence in us. We've been singing about the triune God, and every true believer is in union with the triune God. So we come into His presence as knowing we are broken and come with contrite hearts and come mourning over our sinfulness, come meekly, come humbly coming for grace, but at the same time, knowing that He will forgive 
all our transgressions. And we have offended Him over and over and over. Not a day goes by that there is not some offense against God that He willingly, lovingly, graciously forgives. This is what calls us to love. It is divine forgiveness. And that's what the rest of the opening two verses say. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. That's walking in love that is sacrificial. You know, I've uh, been thinking about 1 Corinthians 16, 13 a lot. Um, that verse is an important one for us in these days because it calls for all of us as believers to be strong, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Very strong language. Be on the alert, that's watching for any attack, any assault on the truth, on the people of God, on the Lord Himself. Stand firm in the faith, unwavering in your convictions in sound doctrine. Act like men, that means fortitude, courage, fight the battle. Be strong. But immediately, in the next verse, the Holy Spirit says, let all that you do be done in love. There are, there are plenty of people who get the thirteenth verse. They, they want to stand firm in the faith. They, they want to create a, a website and make sure that they line up all their guns and fire them at everybody who deviates one inch from what their expected course should be. Everything has to be tempered. Everything, even the battle for the truth, has to be tempered. With love, we do everything that we do in love. And what does that mean? It means that our love calls for us to be forgiving, to be forgiving. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, love is the fulfilling of the whole law. Love is the fulfilling of the whole law. I mean, if you love God, you won't have other gods. If you love God, you won't make an idol. If you love God, you won't take His name in vain. If you love God, you won't disobey Him. If you love God, you'll worship Him. The second half of the Ten Commandments have to do with man. If you love others, you're, you're not going to harm them. Paul makes it very clear. It's this simple. Listen to his language in Romans 13. He lays out the second half of the Decalogue. Verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. That's your debt. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. If you love somebody, you don't commit adultery. If you love someone, you don't kill them. If you love someone, you don't steal from them. If you love someone, you don't covet what they possess. You don't harm people that you love. You do the opposite. You sacrifice for them. You forgive them. Love fulfills everything. Love is the pinnacle. Walk in love. What do you mean with forgiveness and eager self-sacrifice? Look at verse 2 for just a few moments as we kind of wrap up. Just as Christ loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. That's this beautiful language. When Christ went to the cross um, and He was being the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, this was not, this was not something that displeased God. This was not something that was noxious to God. Parts of it are, elements of it are, 
But in the sacrifice of Christ, as an offering and a sacrifice to God in the place of sinners, this gave a fragrant aroma. Let me, let me tell you where that language is coming from. It's really coming from the book of Leviticus. When you start the book of Leviticus and the sacrifices are laid out in the first five chapters, you have three sacrifices in Leviticus 1 to 3. You have described the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. And those three offerings were basically put on the altar and they gave a fragrance. The burnt offering pictured Christ in His complete devotion to God. Think of it that way. We're not talking about sin at this point. We're saying that the, the burnt offering demonstrated the willingness of the Lamb of God in complete devotion to God to give up His entire life. That was a sweet-smelling fragrance to God. That is the very essence of love. Love at its highest point is not only willing to forgive, it is willing to sacrifice itself to effect that forgiveness. Complete devotion to God is seen in that burnt offering. In the meal offering, you see Christ's perfection, the perfection of His character, which also is a fragrance to God. He was holy, harmless, undefiled. He was the Lamb of God without sin. In the peace offering, which also sent forth an aroma that pleased God, He is making peace between sinners and God. So in the burnt offering and the meal offering and the peace offering, there's a sweet aroma. So even in those offerings in Leviticus, you see that there were aspects of the death of Christ that were a fragrance to God. His devotion, the perfection of His character, and His making peace. Those are the things that we can follow. We'll never be somebody's sin offering. We'll never be somebody's trespass offering. But we can be, as Christ was, so devoted to God, so committed in our character to Christ's likeness, that we are the ones who make peace with sinners. This is what it means to love. It's really all about forgiveness. It would be wonderful, you know, if this passage stopped right there, verse 2, but it strangely changes. And all of a sudden in verse 3 you read, but immorality, impurity, greed. What, what is all of that? If God's love, Christ's love, and our love is self-sacrificing and forgiving, you can be sure Satan will pervert that and the love of the world will be selfish, self-centered, self-indulgent, lustful, and destructive. That's why the contrast. That's why verse 7 says you don't partake with the world. How has the church managed to absorb the loveless attitudes of the world? It's tragic. Tragic. We have to be, we have to be the children of God in the world. We have to adorn the doctrine of God. We have to be like our Father, and no one is more like God than when he or she forgives. So we're back to where we started. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. And how do we know that love? We know it because it is lavishly, unendingly forgiving. It's verse 31, never bitter, never wrathful, never angry, never clamorous, never slanderous, never has any malice. It's kind tender-hearted and forgiving. So when we talk about this kind of love, again, just to emphasize what I said at the beginning, we're not talking about some kind of sentimental feeling. We're talking about expressions 
of forgiveness that define us. That's the love that the world needs to see. And I am sad to say they are not seeing it in the professing Church of Christ. May they see it in us. We can only reach as far as we can reach, right? But we can be known by that kind of love. May it be so. Father, we thank You for Your truth. Thank You for this particular word because it is so clear, so direct, so practical. And I pray, Lord, that You will help us to remember that if we walk in the Spirit, we'll see the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, which is love, and then joy, and then peace, and the rest. May we be known by our love, a love that lavishly and unendingly forgives. Anything less than that for us who have been forgiven an unpayable debt is a sin worthy of heaven's discipline. If there's any forgiveness toward any, unforgiveness toward anyone in our hearts, Lord, we confess that, we repent of that, we ask that You would remove it. And may we reach toward the blessed Holy Spirit and walking in His strength, may we be characterized by the fruit of love. May we leave a fragrance, a sweet aroma of love everywhere we go. No matter what is coming at us, and in so doing, be Your beloved children. That's our prayer. Amen. It is only as we understand our fallen nature, Christ's power, His life, and what it means to love that we can embrace two of the most liberating acts of love, forgiving and being forgiven. The Truth About Forgiveness is a book written by Pastor John that helps us further understand these two powerful acts. Order a copy today by visiting our website, gty.org, or giving us a call at 888-57-GRACE. That's 888-57-GRACE. Next week on Grace to You. It should never happen in the Church of Jesus Christ that someone pursues an illicit love. There should never, ever, ever be something like this among the people of God. Just spend your entire life thanking God for what you have for everything that you have, everything that He has given you.